teams, people who are presenting posters. Poster session is uh, today at uh, um, what is it? Five thirty, thereabouts. Uh, you are going to collect uh, presentations, and they are going to be. Uh, you are here. Can uh, stand up just for a second? Uh, and presentations are going to be uh, immediately downloaded on to the website of the conference, so everyone is going to be able to see. As you can see, we are going to stream, uh, the, or we are going to try to stream the uh, event on the YouTube channel. And uh, you have the, you should, maybe it's better if you are not uh, doing it from here, but uh, in a way that. Um, uh, it's going to be available for, for history or whatever. Uh, another small thing, uh, uh, we do have a really exciting uh, both scientific, technological and social program. And I hope uh, you're going to join us for all the events and uh, those things. And that I don't uh, talk too much uh, during the session, I'll uh, first ask Nick to say a few words uh, about the conferences, this is the second one, and he was involved in both of uh, the first one in Cambridge and now uh, here. So, Nick, uh, could you say a few words about the aims and uh, whatever what we want to do achieve here? Thank you, Charles. Thanks, uh, Darka. Yeah, as uh, Darka said, this is the second of these uh, meetings. We had a pretty successful one, uh, seems like yesterday, but it was uh, September 2013 in Cambridge, uh, where that, the idea for that came out of actually uh, collaborations between the guy community and uh, the LSST community. Uh, the idea was to uh, give a chance for uh, scientists in Europe to get more uh, engaged with uh, the LSST effort. And uh, for that, there was quite a key point there, was uh, uh, building enthusiasm, I suppose, and showing what a wonderful uh, opportunity LSST represents and uh, where there is benefit for uh, collaboration and involvement from the various uh, scientific groups across Europe in this endeavour. Uh, Cambridge was a key point there, I think, in the development of uh, bringing in the, uh, the UK community. Uh, the lead of the project there is uh, Bob Mann sitting in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, and I think after that, I think that conference actually was fairly significant point to show that there was indeed, you know, excitement uh, from uh, from the UK to join, and shortly after that, the wheels crumbled and that became reality, so uh, between there and now, we've had that, uh, that, that intro. I think here we've got a chance, it's getting close to the point where the OSST community is, is coming together, and I think here we're building on the, uh, the last meeting where here we were focusing perhaps more on what can Europe contribute at the technical and the scientific level in the more nitty gritty. So you'll see the sessions on the, uh, developing level three requirements, developing the science cases where we've got something to add as a community and something to uh, bring to the bring to the show, but also as a chance to for, for other communities. And I think here we have in Central Europe. It's nice to. Uh, see a good turnout from people um, that will see, uh, be able to talk to our SST colleagues. So I think with that, uh, we'll start the, uh, start the meeting. We've got Jelko up now. Oh, no, 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 no. We, will, we will soon, we will soon start <laughs> getting started. <laughs> then back over to Darko. And I think it's going to be a break. Do take the opportunity to talk, discuss, collaborate. Build, uh, build connections. I think this is going to be uh, another significant uh, meeting on the on the road to uh, LSST. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, a couple more things. Uh, Randy Bowich, who is deputy director of the observatory, is going to say just a few words uh, to greet you. And you probably did notice uh, the local uh, people, uh, those people who have the blue ones. Uh, you, uh, whatever you need, uh, uh, whatever questions or whatever, uh, you have that right to accommodate uh, you. So basically, right?
participants, their colleagues, their guests. Uh, allow me to greet all of you in the name of the Belgrade Astronomical Observatory. Welcome to Belgrade. The meeting, attended by yourself, has an exceptional importance. I have no doubt that it will be successful and that it will greatly contribute to the further development of modern telescope observing technique. Uh, to our guests and to other guests from abroad and other centers, I wish a nice and pleasant stay in Belgrade. I will say shortly the meeting is over. Thank you. So to remind you, there are 
four science teams that we used to design the system. So it's not a statement that LSSD only cares about those four science teams. We will do much more other science with LSSD too, but those four we used to, for example, set requirements on photometric accuracy, astrometric accuracy, or the, basically the size of the mirror and size of the field of view. So these four teams provided concrete numbers that we used to set the system. And I, I suppose most of you know, but if you want to learn more in detail about LSSD, there is this so-called LSSD science book, or we call it affectionately 100 PhD thesis book. There are 10 science collaborations that each provided about 10 projects at the level of PhD thesis work that is described in this book. So if you want to see what people are thinking about doing with LSSD, that is overlapping your science, you can go to this posting on ASTI page and just look it up and see what people thought a few years ago. It's becoming stale, but it's still a good thing to look at. And when you take these four science programs and you try to optimize the system, one surprising, perhaps surprising result was that very different science drivers, going from asteroids all the way to dark energy, basically ask you to build the same system. And that's one of the key aspects of LSSD, that there will be one data set that will serve these diverse science goals that range from finding supernovae to measure the Hubble law, all the way to finding killer asteroids. One single data set. And this multiplexability of the data set is why LSSD will be so powerful. And the current thinking is that about 90% of the observing time will be scheduled essentially as an independent robotic observatory. It will be driven by algorithms, not by time allocation committees making decisions who will get the time. Instead, it will be just a set of mathematical algorithms that will drive the survey. And so when you translate this to numerical values, it turns out we can cover about half of the sky about a thousand times over ten years. So we will open time domain and we will have very deep coedit image that will include those 40 billion objects. It will be of the order of 100 petabytes of data. This illustrates the step forward going from SDSS, the current gold standard of optical astronomy. In the top left corner is real SDSS image. It's about 3 by 3 arc minutes. And the same part of the sky was imaged by Big Lens Survey. And it's shown in bottom left. And it's not quite as deep as LSST, but it's getting there. And it illustrates that as you go fainter in optical astronomy, you see more and more objects. That is the reason why there will be 40 billion objects in LSST large area on the sky and at the same time it's going faint and detecting lots of objects per unit area on the sky. And it's not just the brightness limit, it's also better angular resolution. The two images on the right show a binary quasar that was discovered in SDSS simply because it had weird colors, non-stellar colors. But it's point source in SDSS, that's the top image. And then it was imaged, after it was discovered as an interesting object, it was imaged by the Super Telescope in Hawaii in seeing that it's twice as good as SDSS, and it's roughly comparable to LSSD seeing. And you can now see it clearly as two point sources. So even a factor of two, improvement in angular resolution is a huge deal in astronomy. And so let me now just go over a few slides about these four science teams, just to illustrate briefly what kind of science they would do. The, many people would say the most interesting aspect of LSSD is discovering new physics, doing cosmological studies that eventually might tell us whether dark energy, not just what are the properties of dark energy, but whether dark energy exists. Or it could be, we still don't know, it could be that general theory of relativity is wrong and that they are fooling ourselves with dark energy exists. So that's one of the top science goals of LSST and the main reason why physicists and Department of Energy are interested in LSST. So modern methods for doing cosmological measurements include these five different ways of measurements and four of them you can do with optical astronomy. You can't do CMB, of course, with optical astronomy. 
astronomy, but the other four we can do with optical data, and that's what LSSD is aiming to do. And the end result will be to measure these two functions. The end result is quite simple. We want to measure the Hubble law H of Z and the growth structure function G of Z, and then we will fit cosmological models where you can determine precisely at the level of 1% properties of dark energy, and hopefully it will give us some insight to develop theories that might explain it. Today we don't have any explanation for dark energy. As I said, we don't even know it exists. And one of the key aspects of LSSD is that the same data set will provide four independent probes, so we can combine them together and break some degeneracies that exist when you do so the most exciting thing about cosmological measurements with LSSD is we will have enough statistical power to test departures from GR as opposed to some new cosmological substance called dark energy. And also with many supernovae, we will be able to test our fundamental assumption of anisotropy of the lack of anisotropy of isotropy of universe and homogeneity that we always use when we do cosmology, but we never tested that on the scales that will be probed by LSSD. So that will be potentially Nobel Prize winning research if we find something interesting. And in addition to cosmology, which is of course based on galaxies and supernovae, the galaxy sample, those billions, literally billions of galaxies will enable excellent studies of galaxy formation and evolution. And indeed, galaxies and their photoredshifts are the source of requirements on our band pass complement. It's very similar to SDSS, but it's not just a copy of SDSS filter complement. We did do optimization from scratch, and then for very good astrophysical reasons, we ended up with something that was similar to SDSS. So similar, but we use the same name, CPRIT. But galaxies are driving or drove the selection of that part. Here is another <coughs> picture example of how LSD <coughs> would be better than current surveys like SDSS. This one compares again image of a galaxy from SDSS. It's a boring galaxy. I say boring because a handful of numbers is sufficient to describe galaxy as seen by SDSS. You fit two-dimensional galaxy and you're done. It's not very exciting galaxy. There are millions of galaxies like this in SDSS. But when you improve your data set, when you go deeper and you have better surface brightness limit, like from music survey, the right-hand image is exactly the same galaxy as on the left, but with better data set. A data set that is similar to LSST, even though LSST will be better than music survey, it will be deeper, but it already illustrates how much more detail you get when you go deeper. This is the same galaxy, and now you can see these tidal streams the remnants of some other galaxy that was shredded into pieces by the gravitational force from the big galaxy. And now by modeling in detail those final streams, you can learn the morphology of that gravitational potential that also includes the contribution of dark matter. And so you can study in detail, for example, you can ask, is dark matter halo around galaxies? same shape as the visible matter? Is it universal function or does it vary from galaxy to galaxy? Today we can do this game with maybe a dozen galaxies. With LSSD, the forecast is we'll have about a million galaxies with that level of detail as shown in this one. But it's exciting, isn't it? It's opening totally new science that will require new methods, new models. Uh, solar system science will also be revolutionized by LSSD. Not only that you'll have a sample of millions, literally millions of asteroids, but the data will be exquisite. It will be multicolor photometry, and not just one observation, but we'll have light curves. We will be able to do shape inversion, for example. We take light curve, we can guess what is the axis ratio of the best fitting ellipsoid for those asteroids. And on top of science, LSST will be very relevant for the problem of killer asteroids. Some of you may know that the U.S. Congress enacted a law called Brown Act that directed NASA to make a census of 
asteroids, dangerous asteroids down to about 100 meter level. And LSST is the only ground-based survey that can accomplish this goal. And we are still hopeful that NASA may co-fund operations of LSST. This image, this meteor crater in Arizona, is quite an impressive place. Uh, pyramids do not exist there. NASA added pyramids to illustrate the size of the crater. Trump Tower would be better because it's three times taller than pyramids. And Milky Way science is another area of science that will be revolutionized by LSST. And basically the reason why is if you simply compare it to SDSS that itself changed the way we do Milky Way science. So compared to SDSS, LSST will have about 40 times more stars. So just the size of the sample will be overwhelming. But then also the data will be much more precise than SDSS, both astrometrically and photometrically. And the faint limit will allow you basically to see the turnoff stars all the way to the edge of the Milky Way halo. Before SDSS, there were only about 10 stars at distances <coughs> over 30 kiloparsecs, so in the outer halo. Before SDSS started, we knew only about 10 or 20 stars. With SDSS, now we have tens of thousands of stars in the outer halo that we study. With LSST, we know about 200 million stars in outer halo. So that will be another area of astronomy that will be completely revolutionized with this new data set. And then, given that we are in Europe, Gaia is a big thing in Europe. And so you may ask, well, how can LSST do anything for Milky Way science when we have Gaia? Gaia is fantastic. The answer is, LSST goes deeper than Gaia. And these diagrams show the errors predicted errors for the three main quantities, photometry, proper motions, and parallaxes, as a function of apparent magnitude. And Gaia, of course, is tremendously precise, but Gaia stops at 20, 20.5 in R, and LSST goes deeper by about 5 magnitudes. And it turns out that around 20th magnitude, the errors from Gaia are comparable to errors from LSST. It's almost like the two systems were designed together intelligent design. It didn't happen that way, it just happened to be coincidentally in the same ballpark. But you can view Gaia and LSST not as two competing projects, but as two complementary projects that will together enable science that we could only dream of a few years ago. So let me now quickly go through some status updates. This happened about a year ago. It was first stone ceremony in Chile. The lady in the red coat is Chilean president, Madame de Chilean. The guy here, that's of course Steve Kahn, and this is the director of National Science Foundation. So we had this quite nice ceremony. We dug out this stone, still there. And while they were happy celebrating, the people who do work, they attempted to do work. That's me on the summit. And it's just pretending. They knew some crazy astronomer would go there and try to open the door, so they liked it. They couldn't get there. <laughs> but that's how it looked like a year ago. And now it's very different. We are almost complete with the building. It's growing. This is real. This is concrete and steel. LSST is going to happen. When we met in Cambridge, we could not have made that statement. Now we can. LSST will happen have to get ready for it. More pictures. When you work on a project for 10 years, when all you have is a piece of code that simulates something, once you see the actual con concrete building and iron bars, that's very exciting. That's how it's going to look like in about a year from now, a year and a half. This is cross-section of the whole observatory. There is one error in this image can spot it. They forgot to put the left side on. <laughs> <laughs> there are two mirrors. We don't have two mirrors, we only have one. There is one in the telescope, there is another one in the voting chamber. <laughs> Here is the telescope, so it's it's not going to be the largest telescope in the world, it's only a meter telescope. But it will be the most powerful telescope when you multiply the area of the mirror times the field of view. That's what makes LSST unique. And that's what this 
slide is trying to summarize. So Gemini Sound is essentially the same mirror. Actually, it's more powerful mirror. It has larger effective area. But the field of view for Gemini Sound is just like for any other large telescope. It's small. And the unique feature of LSST is that it will have huge field of view. Unprecedented for 10 meter class telescope. And that's why LSST can observe the whole sky thousand times in only 10 years. If we had field of view like Gemini, it would take us thousand years to do it. So that's the great secret. That secret behind LSST. It's huge field of view. That's why we will get thousand observations in 10 years. And it's unique optical design because we need to maintain good image quality. Weak lensing is one of the main science drivers for LSST. And if you wanted to have 10 square degree field of view, you couldn't do it with classical optical design. The optical distortions would be too large. And so that drove this unique mirror, which is actually primary and tertiary mirror in one piece of glass. This is how it looked like when we took it out of the spinning oven at the University of Arizona Stewart Lab, uh, mirror lab. And then it was polished, and in this slide you can see that it has two optical figures. So this outer part, that's the primary mirror. And this inner part, which has different figure, is the tertiary part of the mirror. And then when it was done, it was protected with this blue plastic cover, and it was lifted, and it was shipped to the airport warehouse in Tucson. It's now done. <coughs> It's sitting at the airport in Tucson, waiting for it to be shipped to Chile when the observatory is done. Five minutes. No way. <laughs> okay. Camera will be unique too. The largest camera for astronomical purpose in the world, 3,000 megapixels, beats your icon for sure. The way to get 3,000 megapixels is modular design. Each of these red squares is what is called graph. It contains nine CCDs, the little blue squares of 4K by 3 CCDs. The purpose of this slide is to demonstrate there is a lot of work going on. And camera is on track, still on schedule and budget. And the third important component of the system is software. It's not just telescope and the camera, it's also software. Unlike many other big software projects that deliver telescope, but then the software was an independent project. Here, telescope uh, software is part of the whole project, and Mario will tell us more details about the software. This is just a reminder of what do we do when we process images in LSST or in general in astronomy. Basically, we fit models to observations and we try to understand what we see on the sky through this abstraction to models. This is an example from SBSS. It's actually, I think Robert made this image. In LSST, it will be much more complicated. We will have co-edition problem. We will have image subtraction problem. We will have to do it within 60 seconds. We will go fainter, so the blending will be much harder problem. So the software for LSST is going to be much more involved than software for SBSS. But conceptually, you can think of eight different logical pipelines that will do the processing and Mario will tell us more about it. Here again is one example of real data sets processed with prototype as the LSD software. It's already operational. Some components are not at the performance <coughs> level that we require for LSD, but we still have a few years to improve it. But already the Subaru Hyperx Prime Camp survey is being reduced using LSD software. It's not vaporware, it's real software on a real survey. And then there is huge simulation effort too, which is not typical of large astronomical projects. This is more like a physics experiment where we understand our system to go to digital level. We have software that simulates the entire system, hardware and performance of all the components. And that's one of the motivations for engaging early with LSST to learn about system, about the system through using this. So, integrated project schedule is summarized here. The point is that in about three years, we will have first images obtained with LSST telescope and LSST sensors. It won't be the full camera, but still, it will be 
half of the power of dark energy camera, which is now only cutting its size. So it will be a huge data set, and we need to be done, and we need to be ready to use it in three years from now, which is not a lot. This year is the one that spends most of construction money. This year we spend on the other $100 million in the system. And so far, we are on budget and on schedule. There are no major problems with our system. There are tiny problems as you go and when you construct something, of course, you will encounter problems. But by and large, we are on budget and schedule. LSSC will happen. So let me summarize this. First time, first part of my talk. I really tried to act like Steve, so I went over time. So apparently I'm out of time and I cannot do the second part of my talk. Is that right? No, yeah. 24 seconds. 24 seconds, okay. <coughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we will deploy the system. And the main, there are two main points. One is that our documents, like science requirements documents, do not specify in detail how we will deploy it. There are, there are overall ideas, but we still have to optimize it using the science drivers at the beginning of the survey. We could not have done detailed specifications how to use the system 10 years before the system is built, for obvious reasons. Science is changing on a daily basis. And then the second point was that there are some overall laws
spent about 10 years of optimization efforts. We know that we are within 10% from the best possible outcome when you look at static science. But we also know that we can improve the time domain science significantly, and we are still working on, on that problem. One quick point for this meeting where people who are interested in LSST came to. When we think of LSST, very often we talk about LSST as something that will be available at the end of the survey, 10 years of data. And for obvious reasons, when we were selling the project, that's what you what, what we were selling. But we have to prepare ourselves for the year one, when we will have one tenth of data, which will be which will not be enable all the science that we can do with LSST, but it already it will be significant data set that we can do science with. And we have to start thinking about what is it that is different in year one that we have to prepare for than we would be doing with 10 years of data. And that's now a process that is beginning. And this table summarizes some basic aspects. For example, the correlated depth will not be that different after year one. It will be only magnitude and half shallower than the whole survey. Because it goes logarithmically, so with one year of data, you already climb up the logarithmic curve, and then you get a little bit more over 10 years. So depth is not that different. But the number of observations, of course, is only one-tenth of the full survey because you only spent one year. If you think about your ability to figure out what you're looking at by using colors, if you think of the ellipsoid color error in five-dimensional space, and you look at the behavior of error with time, the volume of that color error, which allows you to distinguish, let's say, two galaxies in different directions, or two different types of galaxies in the same region, or two different types of stars, or whatever, that core volume is 300 times as large in year one as in year 10. So we do need to go for 10 years to deliver most of science. But again, at year one, there will be some great science to be done. So we already understand this, and we are trying to optimize the system. <coughs> Another important thing is to point out that we have ongoing community-led efforts and Phil Marshall is the editor-in-chief of a white paper that is coming out in a few months that will summarize the current thinking about deployment of LSST. Science book was written, I think, four or five years ago, no, even more, eight years ago, so it's stale. We have, it's not called science book, but it's trying to update our current thinking, what we will do with the system once we are ready for observing. So if you're interested in optimization of LSST, the, the way to proceed is to join the group of about 40 people who are working on that optimization. So to summarize the second part, we have a very good idea of what we would do with LSSD if it was ready tonight. But we also recognize that it could be still optimized and that we would get more science if we continue optimization effort. And that's where everybody interested in LSSD science invited to contribute. And to finish, we are very welcome in Belgrade. There was an article yesterday in the number one Serbian newspaper, like Serbian equivalent of New York Times, with a big piece about LSST. So Belgrade is excited to have us here and I hope we are all excited about being here and let's just enjoy this week and, and let's just talk and think of us as a Thank you.
to increase to, to what I didn't hear? To increase the area of the deep white area survey. Yes, so we, we do have a simulation that we call Pengstar Slide Analysis Team that tries to maximize the area on the sky. We could cover about 30,000 square degrees. And when you look at certain science metrics that we care most about, it is very hard to convince yourself that this that it is not as good as our baseline survey. So in principle, if there is agreement in the scientific community that this would be a better thing to do, we could go and extend area to 30,000 square degrees with a little bit of price to pay in the number of observations per area, per point on the sky. But it's doable, and there is a very detailed analysis of many science metrics available on the web. We can chat later and show you. But yes, the thought has crossed our mind and it's doable and it's a matter of scientific optimization.
end production of added value products um, close to the data, so to avoid you having to download potentially petabytes of, of data to your, um, to your machines. And also to facilitate that, we were making all of our software uh, really available and actually usable, and also making um, all of our uh, internal APIs avail uh, uh, available for, for use uh, by, by users on the outside. Now, everything I'm going to be talking about in this, in this talk is covered in, in what we call the LSST Data Products Definition Document. It's a fairly long paper that states <coughs> what is it we're going to use. Um, I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes talking about level one, level two, and level three, but I do want to encourage you to go to this address, download this document, and read it. We actually keep this document up to date as our understanding of what the best data products uh, to, to deliver are. We try to update it roughly every two years or so. The, the update cadence is going to uh, become more frequent as we get closer to, um, uh, to first light. But there, when I say update, I mean think of it as a refinement for the major changes. As we write software, we get, uh, we get a better idea of what's feasible and what's optimal, and we incorporate it properly. But if you want to, to understand really what is it you're producing, this is a good place to start. And one note is that uh, we actually will be doing a refresh of this document in dollars uh, a month or so. So let me begin with level one. The intent of uh, behind level one is to enable discovery and rapid follow-up of time maintenance. So this is what we want to do with level one. We want to enable you to have an even bigger telescope with a spectrograph on the sky on the most interesting object, potentially within minutes of the discovery. That is what all of level one really is about. In level one, the way we're going to be doing it in level one is by doing real time image reversing as the during unfolds. So for each visit, we take that image, we stream it up to NCSA, we difference it against a deeper template, we detect on, on the difference image, uh, we measure on the difference image, we associate that observation with any pre existing observations. In that application to give you some history or to give you some idea of what this object might be associated with. And then we send you an alert. We say there's something in this area of the sky that is new compared to when the template was built, that has the following properties, that is close to the following objects that we observed before, and all of this happens within 60 seconds of observation. So within a minute of observation, you will get for each visit roughly an order of 10,000 of these alerts. You'll be able to filter them. You will find the most interesting thing and potentially decide to go and follow it up. That's the intent with the system, to have a very rapid, to make a very rapid turnaround and to go to look for the rarest and most interesting um, objects uh, in the sky. The way we do that, or the way that this processing will unfold, uh, I try to, to, to simplify it um, as, as much as possible, and I came up with this sketch, so I hope this will be useful to you to kind of get, get a handle on it. Uh, so we take an image um, on, on the sky. Within roughly five seconds, we send it to the data center, and there we do the, the differencing uh, detection and measurement. And then that will take an order of 50 seconds, and within 50 seconds, we have that in our level one internal data store. So both the process image and the newly discovered objects and associations, et cetera. And then we do a set of things. One is we issue an alert. So within 60 seconds, all the alerts will, all the alerts will have an issue. Um, if you're interested in real-time follow-up, you will connect to this alert stream and, and, uh, and get notified. But we do more than that. We actually store all the alerts in a, in a SQL database. Uh, that SQL database gets updated um, probably once once a night. So at the end of the night, you can actually go and query. If you don't want, to, if you don't care about getting alerted on a 60 second time scale, if you want to, to do, go through a more traditional SQL query database, you will get that um, within 24 hours of observation. We also make all the images available within 24 hours, so the raw images and the difference images. <coughs> And finally, within 24 hours, we update the solar system object catalog as well because we run uh, routines that enable us to detect solar system objects. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that um, after I talk about the So this is level one. These are the data products uh, or services that are going to be uh, interacting with level one. Depending on the cadence, 
weeks, you can choose from alerts to, to the level one database uh, what, what suits better, right? what suits your science needs better. What do we transmit in alert? Uh, rough answer is everything. We basically try to put in all the photometric, astrometric, and shape characterization that we have on the detected source. Uh, we're going to transmit cutouts of the actual <coughs> image where it was detected. So we want to cross, potentially use that to do a different type of measurement than the ones that we're doing, or we could use it to run more sophisticated real focus algorithms with the machine learning to classify the object as needed. Um, we'll send you a time series of all previous detections of the source that we have, and various summary statistics, various features for you to have a time series. Uh, the most obvious one being the period, but um, actually there might be many more than that that will enable you to do classification quickly. And the goal here is to transmit nearly everything else that he knows about any given event so that we enable this downstream classification decision making and that we don't have to go and query back into the L system database. Because we want to avoid a case where um, imagine you have, um, you have an observatory that's following these up. We're not sending you all the data that you need to actually make a decision. You might query back into the database. That's a, that adds that latency to your decision making. That adds a pressure on the database, etc. So we can send stream all of this out instead. Um, we do expect a high rate of alerts. So these can pro could approach about 10 million, even 10 million dollars per night. So this is actually going to be quite a quite significant stream. And that does present a problem. Because first of all, it's very difficult to transmit the stream to everyone. Roughly, if you wanted to, to, to receive an, an, um, an unfiltered stream from LSST, you would have to have one gigabit per second connection, 100 megabytes per second. So that is not something But interestingly enough, or maybe not surprisingly enough, um, the reason why this stream is, is so big is because we're trying to give you everything, all the data that, um, that you might need for any science case, what specific science case is actually in substance. And that is why we're also providing a filtering service. So a filtering service is a way to let the scientists, let astronomers create simple filters that limit which alerts are ultimately forwarded. So if you care about supernovae in um, external galaxies, you may write a filter that basically says, only forward me the objects that, uh, that have the following properties, one of the properties being that it, it occurred um, on top of an external galaxy that will already have on the screen significantly. Um, the way we plan to implement that at the moment uh, is by allowing you to write something like SQL something that looks like SQL, but are effectively queries that act as a scene on this, on this stream, or short snippets of code, so like with Python. Imagine writing a Python function that uh, essentially gets an alert, inspects it, and decides whether you as a user are interested in the alert or not, and forwards it to you uh, or not, depending on, on the answer. Uh, this will run in the data center, so this is something that you'll be able to use to cut down the stream million alerts to the stream, something that's more manageable, maybe a couple thousand per night, that you can actually then and use um, to, uh, to, to direct the telescopes. And to give you a feel for what the user defined filter might look like, um, if this is a Python function, this could be a Python function, say this, that this is a sketch we haven't, so we haven't got to the point of constructing this code, so this will definitely change. But to give you a feel, you get an alert, you query for the property that you care about, so for example, objects that have just appeared, I would say if the number of sources is greater than one, return false, I don't care about those. Then I'm looking at whether the nearest neighbor is a galaxy. If it's not, return false. And then finally I return true or false if this object is within two effectively on the center of that galaxy. Uh, this is again, this is pseudo code. You can think of this as pseudo code just to, just to give you an idea of what kind of capability you will have to filter the filter alerts that uh, Now, for this is already something that I think will be quite useful, but you can imagine much more sophisticated capabilities built on top of it. Um, we anticipate that the community, that is you, will want and will also um, build uh, advanced public filtering services, via event brokers, that will enable uh, even more functionality on top of what I just shown you. 
So these kinds of robots may include things such as cross-correlation of LSSD alerts with external catalogs and other alert streams. So our filtering service that I just described will just let you inspect what we know about that event from LSSD. But some of the most interesting science comes from cross-correlating with other catalogs, and that's something that we will not do. Um, classification engines will not tell you this object is IRLIRA, or will not tell you this object looks like a supernova. Um, that is the sort of thing that the, that the event broker can do for you um, if one exists. More extensive annotation of alerts, um, coordination of all groups, that's actually a very interesting problem. LSSD will generate a tremendous amount of amount of alerts, a tremendous amount of transient alerts, and it would, it would really be a shame if all telescopes in the world were chasing the same object. Uh, some kind of coordination of follow-up activity will be necessary in the air to LSSD, and that is something that these kinds of facilities, uh, both facilities and help with. And then incorporation of other contextual information, um, you know, where this where this alert occurred, uh, what else is near it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is all very interesting functionality that can be provided by brokers. Now we are, the reason why I'm talking about this so much is that we are encouraging the community to self-organize and develop such alert brokers and networks. Um, this LSSD is primarily a facility that will generate these alerts, will provide some invasive way to, to go through them, but the, these kinds of, this kind of functionality is outside of our purview. And in the US, there already is a project that is trying to do that. It's uh, led by NLEO, it's called Antares. Um, I'm not sure about what the situation is in Europe, but in some ways, Europe is fantastically positioned to build one of these. Um, firstly, um, there's an opportunity to build an existing archives and expertise, like say, cross correlation with external catalogs, some of the best world archives are here in Europe. There's expertise with alerts, ranging from Gaia to others. Um, and I think this is one thing where um, one should, where we as a community should start organizing sooner rather than later so we're ready on day one uh, when LSSD begins having these kinds of facilities to be able to do filtering uh, and get the time so. So that's why I spent so much time talking about it because I think this is something that, uh, that this group here uh, could <coughs> work on and, and should start thinking about. Now, Moving on to something slightly different uh, in level one, I mentioned solar system objects as well. They're a little bit different because with them, uh, the alerting on a 60 second time scale is, is, uh, is less of an issue. Uh, we identify solar system objects uh, within 24 hours uh, if we have enough observations going back to identify um, a certain asteroidal uh, PSF like object as being consistent with motion of long period tracks. We measure their orbital elements, we then measure the coordinate properties, we make all that available to the 24 hours of, of orbit termination, and um, based on the simulation Joko mentioned, we are expecting to provide orbits for an order of 70% of all NEOs prior to age 22, um, assuming, assuming the, the, the current cadence that we have. So depending on what the cadence is, this can go over the top. Now let me move on to level two and we'll briefly talk about enabling deep sky and high precision astrophysics. Level two are, is produced in annual data releases. The, the goal of level two is really to go as precise as possible and as deep as possible. So we are going to give you a calibrated, consistently processed catalogs and images, um, catalogs of objects, detections, the sections of the on different symmetries, etc. And we'll make these available in data releases. It will be coming out annually, except in year one. In year one, we will have two data releases uh, because LSSD data set is going to be quite significant even after six months. So in year one, we'll create a first data release based on the first six months of data, and then the second data release based on the full year of data. And after that, uh, it will be uh, a data release once a year. Every time we do a data release, we do a complete reprocessing of all data. So we, we start at the beginning of the survey, we use uh, a, um, the newest code that we have at that point, and we self consistently process everything. So these are not incremental releases, this is every time we do a release, we process everything, potentially the amount of release. Now, this is, I think, a very interesting set of numbers, and I think it points to something that Joe mentioned as well. In DR1, we already expect to have seen 18 billion objects. Remember that I told you that by the end we'll see 37 billion. So already, after six months, 
analysis of the data set will be quite formidable and interesting. And if, you, if you're wondering you know, why, where do all these come from, uh, it's, uh, you can look at the curves of growth of, of, the, of the counts, but the, roughly these are stars. Uh, we, we catch most of the stars of the galaxy that we run through the galaxy fairly early. And uh, it's, it's largely for the reason that we run out of stars quickly. We observe outside of the so we, we get them if we get two. <coughs> now, level two, the archive, let me say a little bit about the archive content, contents. Uh, it will consist of, of uh, roughly two types of products. One are images. Those images are going to be processed business and uh, a number of different kinds of co-eds. There's much more of this in the data products that finish it up in the section 5.4, so I'll be pointing you there in more details. And then there are catalogs of sources, objects, and core sources. Um, so these are catalog, kinds of catalogs that they're used to, to seeing in uh, surveys such as SDSS, for example, or DES recently. Um, these are also described in analysis in more detail. If you're wondering what is in those catalogs, you will find the most, you will find usual measurements such as PSF magnitudes, um, aperture magnitudes, you will find um, various um, other kinds of extended sources, uh, extended source uh, modeling. But let me just focus on, on this aspect here because this is something that will be unique to us as team. One of the things that we'll be doing is um, instead of just directly measuring, for example, on the co uh, we will detect all sources on co images to get to derive a library of But then, given the position of those sources, we will actually go back to individual epochs and simultaneously fit the properties of the sources to the data in the individual epochs. It's very easy to show that that is the optimal way to do measurement. And it also allows us to do things such as fit moving point source models. So we have stars with uh, noticeable proper motions. On coads, those may look actually extended. Uh, you may actually be using them for galaxies. But if you just detect that there's a source on co at that position, you go back to the visual epochs and simultaneously fit for a PSF-like object that's about to move, you will recover both the properties of the object, both the properties of the object, as well as its property motion. So that is the sort of thing we'll be doing for every single detection of the catalog. And then the other thing that is, uh, that is often unique is that for extended sources, instead of just giving one measurement, one estimate, of the properties of the object, and specifically maximum likelihood of, of which are models we're doing. Uh, we're going to be creating cost for this uh, source of type, double source of type models. We will try to characterize uh, generally it's a likelihood here. So we will sample the likelihood of those parameters, and instead of just giving you one set of parameters, we will give you an order of hundreds of parameters so that you can then mold that with, uh, with any or multiply that with any prior that you have and Education values for uh, science cases that require that level of precision. And typically, the, that is required for, the, for uh, science cases involving understanding of the nature of dark energy. Um, then we'll have more or less uh, vanilla object characters, not that object characterization, bathroom moments, electricity measurements, the trojan fluxes, the flux of radii, etc., etc., uh, as well as measurements of colors um, and variability statistics. So if you care about um, systematics from the measurement, every time we put out a data release, this is what you would download, this is what you would work with. Finally, let me talk about uh, level three of it. I said the one data products are like the local two data products are um, produced on an on annual basis. They let you get to, to really systematic, limited uh, capability of data. But they are catalogs, they are the new reflects on biases that we put in when we decide uh, what is it that we're even going to measure. And there always will be some added value things that you will want to compute on top of that. that if you have top of catalogs and on top of um, the images themselves. And what's enabled that? Um, so level three data products are products, are added value products created by the community, so not by us. What we do, so these products, 
the enabled science in this case is not fully covered by what will by what will do generate level one and two. And here are a couple of examples. So we wanted to build a catalog of supernova light echoes. So these are we're not going to be actively looking for light echoes or detecting them. Um, this is something that you may want to write uh, where you're going to write a piece of code to run as level three. Um, characterization of the fuse structure, uh, our networks are very biased towards point source point sources, or I should say towards localized sources. So localized point sources, extremely crowded with photometry. Um, for example, black hole clusters, a special a special of black hole clusters is going to be much better than the general purpose code that we might be writing. Uh, and custom measurement algorithms. So there may be a type of measurement that we're not doing that may be uh, required for your science case. And we as analysis we want to make it easier for the community to create and distribute these products. And we kind of have three pillars on which we want to enable you to, to build those easier. One is we want to make all the software that we're writing, all the LSS data processing software stack available, uh, enable limited end user analysis at the data center so that you don't have to download large quantities of data, and also you need to use a database and workspaces um, on that data center so that you can, if you build these kinds of catalogs, you can actually have them next to LSS data and so this is my almost last slide. To give you a bit more detail on what we or how we want to enable this solution, we are engineering the LSS software stack to be modular, reusable, documented, and supported, and, and user friendly. Now this is all the tall order, but this is what we're going to try to try to do. And we're making it available under GPLV3 right now. Um, and I would point to session eight on Tuesday to learn more about it. The goal here is that we're going to be spending um, hundreds of, of person years of work developing this code. Typically, when you need to build something slightly different, you don't need to rewrite everything from scratch. You want to modify. And that is what we want to let you do here. Um, when I said in the previous slide we're going to enable computing available to the archive, what we will do is we'll make available to you probably ten percent of our storage and computing resources. And that comes out to about fifty to hundred terabytes. Terraforms. Now, that may sound like a lot to an individual user, but it's actually a fairly small amount of compute because if you think of an order of hundreds of users using this, um, <coughs> this comes out to you know, roughly a powerful workstation uh, worth of, of, of computing per user. So we're going to use, we're going to focus this to power Jupyter type remote uh, analysis environments so you're able to do uh, something like iPad or notebooks that run on, on the server end and a small agency type processing cluster. But one thing that I would like to make clear is that it's unlikely that, uh, that the community will be able to use this facility to reprocess the entire LSS data set because that is just uh, that is just out of uh, out of reach with uh, these kinds of uh, capabilities. And it is 10% of the total computing that we are using to produce to reprocess the entire data set, so it's somehow almost on the that's just going to be difficult. Now, the archive will be located at NCSA. Uh, NCSA in the US is the National Center for Security Applications. They, their reason for existence is to, to have big machines. We have no <coughs> reason to believe that there won't be bigger machines next to the other system facility at the time that we're running. And that may be a way to get significant additional supercomputing capacity kinds of reprocessing in the U.S. And then <coughs> beyond the U.S., right schoolers may build their own computing facilities to support large scale processing. We're using our software. And that's one of the important things that we have to enable to, so that you can download all we have, use it in your facility to the extent possible, and just write the piece of code that you need to do. And so let me just finish here. Again, finding out more about the data products, which really, this is what LSD is to you. Find out more about the products so we can discuss the slash DVD. And I'll also be here with a summary slide uh, with a couple more links to the websites that will be of interest to you. And also know that there are many people from LCC Data Management at this conference. Um, so find us, talk to us, we'll be happy to tell you more. And we'll also be happy to hear from you what is it that you need to enable uh, your slides to the system. Thank you. Sometimes the questions by my head.
aggressively shutting him up only 10 minutes late. So. Just, just to be closer, please.
interesting data will start appearing in 2020 or so, and then we get the full camera uh, on the telescope, and then it becomes really interesting. So don't think, if you're a member of LSSD Science Collaboration, um, expect data in 2020, 2021 timeframe rather than 2022. But the details can get to be finalized, and that, that is more of Steve Kahn that will not question. Okay, if nobody else has any questions, you can go and get your coffee, providing it's red is in five minutes. So we're five minutes ahead of schedule, which I guess means we will have a five minute extra break. Is that right? Yeah, I think that they're, they're just, uh, they're just thinking of it. Okay, in that case, talk among yourselves for five minutes and then we'll <laughs> <laughs>